Hello. Hello. Sorry, we had some problems with our computer about the, the presentation, so we, are, we needed to change the, the actual computer to a Macintosh. Okay. So, hi. I don't think yes, I need to talk softly because it's Saturday morning, but <laughs> I think that we are all awake. So, let's start. I'm, I'm Jorge Tutor. I'm a Drupal developer. And I work as a software project manager at Metadrop. We develop complex websites with complex business uh, logic. And this is why, for us, uh, the having test is very, very important in our development. I also like to contribute. So uh, this is my Drupal user. I'm in the module maintainer of some modules on, on Drupal. Maybe you know some of them. So in this talk, we are going to see a short introduction about BDD. It's a complex or a very long uh, a process. So I'm going to try to resume in only 40 minutes what it's BDD. Okay? So we are going to have an introduction to BDD, how projects are built, ensuring product quality. We are going to talk about test, speaking the same language as our client, and how we can involve the client in our development, which is the most important thing, because the client has the knowledge. And the BDD methodology, because we are going to see that it's like common sense. Okay? It's just to find a language that we can use, both us and the client. A short uh, introduction, integration with Drupal, like just a quick note. There are a lot of good talks, in, even in Drupal camps, talking about Bihat, so we are not going to, to talk in detail about this uh, tool. And a final example, just to understand everything that we have uh, said before, okay? So, let's start. What is BDD? Okay, BDD is a behavioral-driven development, and it uh, emerged from test-driven development. The easy idea is that you are going, sorry, you are going to, to develop after uh, writing the test. So you are, being, you are going to develop driven by those tests. And the difference between TDD and BDD is that we are going to focus on business interest and the, from the technical inside. This is the main difference. Right? In this uh, process, we are going to involve the client and get his knowledge. Okay. Uh, yesterday there were a very awesome talk by Theon talking about TDD and how we can use that in Drupal 8 with all different. Uh, it's, uh, it was a technical uh, session. I recommend you to see that session if you didn't were there. Okay. And um, today we are going to see some difference between DDD and, and BDD. So there are a few concepts that we need to keep in mind. One is that clients and users have needs, and this is why we are making software, okay? We are not just creating web pages, we are creating software, and this is the main difference. And with Drupal 8, we are st uh, with, right now there's no more a CMS, okay? So we are starting developing pr projects, uh, we need to satisfy those needs. And a project, of course, it's the sum of all functionality. Each feature that we have in our project will make our project stronger, better than the previous release. And this is the key concept. We are not talking about specifications. We are not talking about characteristics of the system. We are talking about features, what the users are going to do with our application. And the sum of them makes the project. This is the idea of all of that, okay? So how projects are built? or are used to be built. Of course, we have the idea. Maybe the, uh, the project, it's a corporative site, it's a newspaper, a commerce, a social network, whatever. Okay? Simple, there's always a main idea that we, to, that we want to evolve. Of course, there's the client. The client has the knowledge. And it's very important to talk with the client, to work in agile method or methodology, and get all information that he has about his business, okay? 
Also, there is the development team. We have backends, uh, frontends, uh, testers, site builders, UX. And they are, it's very, very important that they are being talking with the client daily. Those team, this team is going to choose, of course, some reliable components. All of us work with Drupal. Drupal has uh, the core and also contrib modules. So when we get a project, we select which are the modules that we are going to use, I don't know, views, form, whatever, to build the project. And we can assume that those modules or libraries are tested enough, okay, maybe. But we also need to develop our custom components because we will need to add business logic to our product. And even if we, if we don't have, uh, we don't need to create custom models, maybe using those country models in a different way, we need to test that also, because we need to test the business model. Not that views could, uh, could filter a query or a web form could send a, a form post. We need to, to test our business logic, what the client wants us to do. So, <coughs> how we can ensure product quality. How, how can we be sure that we are doing tests? We are, seeing, we are doing things right with tests. Okay, so why? Why to test? Of course, to ensure components quality, to meet specifications, and also to avoid regressions. It means, when you, for example, you are working in agile process by sprints, and then the second or third sprint, you are broken previous release. It's not, uh, it's not good at all. You need to check that. So this is why tests are really, really important. So we have two options, obviously. We can test after development, or we can test before development. What do you think? OK, so let's uh, choose the red pill, the left one, after development. This is what happened. We have finished our project. Maybe we are right now in 100% of the budget. There are features done. I don't know how, but we have done that, okay? We, there's no regression, incredible. But then we realize that we have no test. And maybe because we are going to maintain that project later, and of course we know that we need test because if not uh, upgrading Drupal models, for example, without testing and going to production, it's not a good idea. Or maybe because, oh, in the contract says that we need to provide tests. So let's start adding new tests. This is a very big problem because we are just adding more hours to the project. Maybe the client is not going to pay for, for those hours. And there's no benefit. There's no real benefit. OK? There's a second option to test at the end of each sprint. That way is better approach than the previous one, obviously. Because with that approach, we are avoiding regressions. Okay? In each sprint, we are going to add tests. And of course, uh, if we are broken the previous release, we will know. But we are still incrementing our development time, which is the good option, doing tests first. Of course, you will need also to invest time doing those tests. But you will go in to save time where? Because you are going to agree with the client what the application is going to do step by step. So you are going to just to code once. This is the most important thing. And also, you don't need to stay and doing the test manually. So you can code something, open the terminal, run test, and in the background, these tests are running, and you can still code in. So you don't need to open your Firefox or your Chrome. You can do it with that. And you can be 100% sure that every step that the test says is going to be achieved. Okay? And you have talked with the client before, and you know that this is what he wants. So how we are testing functionality? 
Of course, I think that everyone knows about this pyramid, about unit integration and functional test. And this is a pyramid because on the unit level, the deepest level, we are going to test more deeply every, everything. But in, on up levels, we are going to test less. And we are closing to the uh, business logic. Okay? So this is how unit testing looks like. Okay? The idea of unit testing is that we are going to code classes, methods. It's simple for us. It's we need to add uh, unit tests in our projects, okay? But it's very, very complicated to involve the client at this level. Because if he is not a technical user, he's not going to understand anything about that, okay? Of course, we have integration testing, which is the idea. Maybe we have two different unit tests, but if we want to integrate uh, two components, it's important to check that they fit together. And functional testing. In functional testing, we are checking the browser. We are checking which steps are the user following. But we are not talking here nothing about the value that the user is going to get. And also, it's a little complicated to understand. Of course, technical user is really easy, but for clients, it's complicated to involve them and, and say, OK, please check that. And let me know if it's what you want that application must do. But wait a minute. I have said that we are going to test all unit things. So if each component is working, why I should start adding functional or integration test? Stupid. It's a waste of time. Do you think? OK. Let's see. Let's see what happens when you are testing just components. <laughs> but you're not testing those components together. This is the infinite door. Let's go to the security lock. <laughs> and this is my favorite. The same happens with software, OK? So this is why it's really, really important to test all things at all levels. OK. But there is a, a problem. Maybe we have all un unit tests. Maybe we have all integration tests. Maybe we have some functional tests. But have we created the right product? What I mean? Maybe we have created the product as a specification says but we need to create good products. And this is the main difference between verification and validation. With verification, we are checking if the product is right. But with validation, we are checking if we have built the right product, which is the most important thing. And it's impossible to build the right product without the knowledge of the client. So speaking our client's language is the most important thing when we are building software. So when client says, if we don't talk with the client, the client is going to just give us a document, a very big document, like a nightmare, with a lot of specification, a lot of points that we need to follow, OK? And just that. No user interaction, uh, just uh, specification. And if we stop at that, at that point, the project will fail, absolutely. We need to talk with the client. Because developers need user welfare perspective, mockups, uh, understanding why the user is doing those, those things. Okay? Um, what happened with the users? Okay. What user need? We need to think always on the user. Okay? Every, every time we are discussing with the client, we need to put the user in the center of the conversation. Okay, we need to, to think which is the value for the user. Because if not, that feature should be removed. So let's use the same language. I'm going to give you three key points. Who, what, and why. Who is going to make the action? What kind of action we want that the user must do? 
and why. And this is the most important thing, because if there's no why, there's no feature. We should remove that, that specification. So there's a formal sentence, which is as a blank, I want to blank, so that blank, that it's easy for us and easy for understand with the client. Just the client needs to fill the gaps, and we can transform a specification document to that. Some examples, OK? As an anonymous user, of course, I want to register into the site so that I can access to the private section. What does that mean? That if there is no private section, maybe in that application we don't need a register form. Because if there is no extra value for the user, why? I think that everyone has uh, worked in a project that sometimes users that some, uh, do something, but you don't know why. It's like just a feature that you are creating, but so this is the most important thing. Other example, as an editor, I want to create articles, or as an editor, I want to edit articles so that I can update them and fix mistakes. Okay, it maybe it could be a different reason or whatever, but we need to add a reason about that feature. Okay, but maybe a user story is so abstract. It's a high level. So we need to go to the detail because we are going to test it. Okay? So these are the use cases. Use cases describe interaction for each user story. And this is acceptance criteria. It means that we, after we have decided a uh, user story with the client, we talk with him and define which are the steps that the user is going to follow. Okay, so for the previous uh, user story, these are the steps. Given I am an anonymous user, I don't have an account. When I go to user register, I should see the fields, name, surname, email, password. I fill a name with test name. At that, at that point, without mockup, we have in our minds that form. There's no mockup, but we can imagine what we are going to see. Okay, when I press create content, then I should see welcome test name, whatever and an account for test name has been created. Really, really simple. This is a very simple example. But we and the client, we understand. So use case anatomy are this one. OK, we have the precondition, which are the initial step. Then the user is going to make some actions. And there are the post condition. OK, post condition is uh, the state of the system after the user has uh, done the actions on the application. Okay? So we are checking both in those cases. And alternative states and error states, we are going to see them in next slides. So this is an example. So for the previous uh, example, precondition is that I am an, an anonymous user. I don't know how, but I am an anonymous user. Okay? This is axioma. Then actions. I go to user register, I should see some fields, I fill the name with, I press, okay? And the post condition is that an account has been created. Simple. Alternative steps. steps. When a user is filling a form or doing some action, sometimes he needs to make choices, okay? So we need to take into account those choices. For example, imagine a simple scenario. Here, the user needs to uh, choose between uh, user type, so can select company or individual. If he selects company, he just needs to fill company name. But if he selects individual, he will need to fill name and short name. And then the form is exactly the same. OK? We are going to cover all in our test. So this is an example in text. I select individual, a user type, I fill username with Peter, okay, an individual account has been created. Also post condition can change. And if I select company, then a company account has been created. Simple? Error states. It's maybe it's harder to understand than the previous one. And the idea is that uh, error state is a state that you need to remove if you want to continue. Okay? So imagine that you are filling a form and you uh, add uh, a field that's wrong. If you don't uh, fix that mistake, you can continue to the next step of the form or, or whatever. Okay, so these are the errors. And there is a special concept 
called Sunny Day. And this is the workflow that the user is going to follow without any error step. And this should be the minimum steps as possible. So in reality, this is a simple scenario to cover our user story that the user needs to do. Okay? So in this case, this is the simple path to do the, to do the task. So another state could be like if I fill mail with fake mail and I press create content, then I should see email field is not valid. My recommendation is try to group all error states in the same test. We are going to see them later, how we structure those tests. And of course, it's, uh, it's subjective, OK? You can take whatever you want of that presentation. And optimizing user scenarios. What, uh, what we do? First, we test the sunny day, simple scenario. And then we start covering alternative steps. So instead of creating, for example, this test, we try to create only one. So that way we are covering, covering in one test all options of that, form, of that form. Maybe we need like two or three scenarios, but as, as, as less as possible, we will try. So I think that everyone can come to the conclusion that what is BDD about? So we need first to define the test and use cases with the client, OK? Then, of course, those tests is going to fail because there's no code. There's no code. We have not developed anything about those tests. Then start implementing the unit, start implementing that in the application. And the last step is to verify that we have accomplished what we wanted. Is there any way to test that automatically? Because, of course, you are writing in a paper, but you need to check that manually. Of course, we have uh, talked with the client, and uh, we, are, we are sure that uh, what we are coding is what the client wants. But do we need manually? There's a language called Gherkin. Okay? This started with Cucumber and GBHive. Um, as you can see, there are simple sentences. It can be translated also if you want, OK? And it's really, really close to, to what we have seen before, OK? So our, the, machine, the machine is going uh, to translate all these to browser actions. <clears throat> and the framework that we are going to use in Drupal with PHP is Bihat. OK, I have, as I have said, there's a lot of good talks about Bihat. So we are not going to cover how we're going to integrate that on Drupal. But we are going to see some quick notes, OK, integration with Drupal. This is a composer library. So you just need to download it. Of course, we are going to use the Drupal extension. There are a lot of different extensions. There's also Laravel extension for other frameworks extension that uh, they have uh, Bihat and also some libraries that integrate with Drupal. With Drupal. <coughs> and the main files and folder for Bihat are those. We have the config EML, where we are going to set which libraries we, are, we want to use, the base, base URL of our project, uh, some variables, whatever is going to be on that config file. Also, we're going to have in the bootstrap folder the context. The context are the classes that will contain the sentence or the steps that we are going to write on those tests. The key of that is that there's an initial set of actions, but uh, you can add more if you want, OK? And the features is with the folder where we are going to add the tests. This is a structure, OK? Features in one folder, put the stuff in another, and the config file, another folder. To execute on, you just need to run this command, OK? Pika, the config EML, you can add task, different things, OK? The execution, you will be seeing which steps are executing 
and which class is uh, executing, has the knowledge of that step. And after that, you could see like a successful, successful execution or a failed one. You can see how many scenarios, how many use cases, and how many steps have been done. And also, if that failed, you will see which file. And I recommend you to name the file with the user story. That way, you will see at first sight which it's happening, okay? And of course, you should integrate that with integration, uh, integration tool, okay? Because if you have tests, no one is going to run those tests. Maybe their own test, yes, but you're not going to, to run other ones' tests. So it's important to have that. So final example, okay? So imagine that we have a form, this is a register form, and we uh, agreed with the client that for this sprint we are going to take into account two user stories. First one is that an anonymous user, I want to register into the site so that I can join the program. This is why. And the other one is an anonymous user, I want to pull data from LinkedIn while I'm registering into the site so that I can do it e easier. So let's go to the first one. We open the file, we create a file, anonymous.userregister.feature. You can name whatever you want. This is my recommendation, okay? Then feature, we write here the user, sto uh, user story. And then we will have the first scenario, the first use case, the sunny day, then alternatives, and then errors, okay? So let's go to the first scenario. So, the precondition is that given I'm an anonymous user and I go to user register, okay? Then I will start seeing things. I see type, I see name, I see surname, I should see why do you want to join the program, and I should see I accept the terms and conditions, okay? Can you scroll, please? Here. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. So then I start filling those fields, okay, with uh, some data. Then I will click and create account, and I will see welcome to the program. An individual account has been created. Really, really simple, okay? What could be an alternative step? So imagine, for example, that I select, instead of individual, I select company, and company doesn't have surname. So in that test, I'm not going to cover what I see, because I have already covered in the sunny day uh, test, and I just select company, and I should not see surname. I don't know why, how, but the, the application is going to hide that field if I select that option. And imagine how powerful th this is, okay? Error steps. Imagine, for example, that we just enter into that page and just click directly on create account. And we are going to, to see that that field is required, another field is required, and so on. Please, can you scroll, please? Uh, perfect. And we also can add more logic. Like, for example, when the client decides that the, why do you want to join the program should have at least uh, 300 characters. So if, we, if we, I fill that, that field with a short test, then I click on create account and I should see that you should have more than 300 characters or whatever. Let's try the other one. Same as the previous one, just adding LinkedIn on the name of the field. And in this case, the precondition is that I have a LinkedIn account, okay? Because if not, it's not possible to, to do that feature. Can you scroll a little? Sorry. Uh, okay, so after pulling data from LinkedIn, uh, I will start seeing on that, on that fields which are the, that the surname is the LinkedIn test surname. We have pulled that data from LinkedIn. Okay? So alternative steps, what could be? Okay. So imagine that I select company Imagine that the profile is incomplete. What happened? If there is no username or there is no surname, I should uh, show a message. I should just keep that field empty. What I should do? And imagine error steps. 
maybe the user is not logged in on LinkedIn, or maybe the user doesn't give us privileges to pull data from LinkedIn. What happened? Is he going to come back to the website? We are going to show him a message on that, on that form. We are not going to do anything. We need to, to agree that with the client. So what do you think? Easy? Willing to write your own test? Any questions? So thank you.